We are nearing the three month mark since the release of the PS5 and Xbox Series X, and something that I've been seeing lately is a bit of a sentiment across a lot of people who have been able to at least get them, because obviously tracking one down right now is a little bit of a mess, is somewhat of a mixture between some people being very happy with getting the system when they did and enjoying some of the new games that have come out, as well as the better performance of some titles, and other people kind of wondering, why did I buy this right away when there's really not any new titles I care about? And so I kind of want to talk about the idea of, was it worth buying a next-gen system right at launch? Now, obviously this is a pretty subjective thing because again, you're seeing these two opposite sentiments from a lot of different people. But I think there are some ways we can look at aspects of the situation objectively. Let's take a look at what has been released for these two systems so far, how that stacks up to past systems, what we have planned out for this year, and maybe just have a little bit of sprinkled in context for how crazy 2020 was. I wanna begin with by talking about what I think is one of the heaviest points of criticism I've seen between these two systems, the lack of next-gen exclusives. When you get down to it, between the Xbox Series X and PS5, there's basically six games between both of them right now that are true next-gen exclusives. This is not including games that are ported re-releases of Xbox One or PS4 games. We're not including games that are things that have been made available simultaneously in all of them. We're just looking at those that are only playable on these platforms and possibly PC. Demon Souls, which yes, is a remake, but it's a much more thorough one than most of the other PS4 and Xbox One ports we're seeing, so I am counting that as a proper new release. Godfall, Astrobot's Playroom, Enlisted, and after launch most recently, we've seen the release of The Medium on Xbox and Destruction All-Stars on PS5. That is it. And so a lot of people have been really fixating on this concept of, you know, I bought this next-gen system, but really, I could have just been playing pretty much all the games that we're actually caring about right now on older hardware. In fact, some of the biggest games that were really emphasized at launch for the PS5 especially, like Spider-Man Miles Morales, is something that's available on the PS4 as well. Now, there's two things that I think are very important pieces of context for the situation, though. One, 2020 was an absolute mess of a year, and some people have brought up the argument that maybe the systems just should have been pushed back so more stuff was ready, which I think is fair. But the other thing, too, is this really isn't all that much better than last gen. When the PS4 and Xbox One came out, at least when it comes to, again, next-gen exclusive titles, really there weren't that many more games, at least for PS4. Xbox One did have a lot more titles right away than the Xbox Series X is currently seeing. It had games like Forza 5, Dead Rising 3, and a handful of others. And the PlayStation 4 launched with titles like Killzone Shadowfall, Knack, and had a couple of other exclusive releases come out during those first three months as well. In total, each system basically had five next-gen exclusive titles in the first three months, which is better than what we're seeing right now, but not really by that significant of a margin. And really, you could even argue that quality-wise, we're seeing just as good of games right now. Admittedly, part of what does make this a little more rough for than a current gen as well, though, is the fact that the kind of future timeline of game releases is a little all over the place. We've gotten some general dates and kind of ideas for when some titles are coming out, but for the most part, PlayStation and Xbox have been keeping some games release dates very close to the chest, outside of just some generic windows. Even Ratchet and Clank, which was one of the most heavily pushed games for the PS5, still doesn't actually have a solid release date. We were told it was going to be a launch window title, which is a very vague term that, depending on who you ask, could either mean the first three months, which obviously hasn't happened, all the way to the first year. A similar example back on the PS4 was Infamous Second Son, which was a launch window title for the PS4 and did not get released until the following May. And as much as I want to play Ratchet and Clank, given the kind of timeline they've given us so far and the amount of news, I'm not sure if we're going to see it even that soon. Though they could always surprise us, which I would be very happy to have happen. Really, what I'm trying to say here is the fact that Yes, when you early adopt a system, there can be a very heavy mix of emotions as far as whether or not that was worth it for your personal purchase. But I think this time around, there's a much stronger sentiment of it not being necessarily as good of a thing for some people. And a lot of that, I think, comes down to two major things, backwards compatibility, and hype. Of the two, I think hype is a much simpler thing to break down because of the fact that, well, people were really excited for these next-gen systems, and given how very difficult they've become to grab, and the kinds of trials and tribulations some people have gone through to just get one in the first place, sometimes if you went through all that trouble to grab one, and then you don't actually feel that happy with your purchase, it just stings all the more. And again, I don't think anyone's necessarily unhappy with the systems themselves. I love both consoles, and I think both of them are going to end up being great purchases. It's just that kind of idea of, was it worth grabbing right away, especially with how difficult it has been for some people. Now, backwards compatibility is a slightly more interesting to talk about, because in general, it is definitely a positive thing, obviously. But 
I think it has slightly affected people's perceptions of what's going on with these game libraries. Back with the PS4 and Xbox One at launch, there was no backwards compatibility, so everything felt like a brand new thing. You had to buy new copies of games, it was a whole new interface and store for both systems. It had that feeling of new, which the PS5 has certainly kind of carried over a little bit by having a totally redone interface compared to the PS4, but the ability of being able to import all the games you own from past systems, I think is making a lot more people hyper aware of the fact that cross-gen support is just a major thing. And in a lot of ways, the cross-generation support that we've been seeing for this generation is probably the best there has ever been. True, last generation didn't have any backwards compatibility at all, but even in past systems that did support backwards compatibility, oftentimes it was just the benefit of, oh, hey, cool, I can still use my old game. Whereas this time around, we're seeing lots of situations where, oh, did you own the past generation version of this game and we re-released it with more content and better stuff and better visuals? Guess what? You can just do a free upgrade on us, or other games that don't necessarily get full-blown re-releases like that, still offering patched improvements to take advantage of next-gen hardware. A very common thing we're seeing across a lot of the big exclusive titles from last gen, like with Gears of War and Forza Horizon 4 on the Xbox, or more recently, God of War and Ghost of Tsushima on the PS5. This cross-generation period has actually offered some of the biggest benefits to consumers as far as having an easy way of bringing a lot of your stuff over and continuing the experience and getting more out of libraries you may have previously owned. But because that has become such a heavy emphasis, I think there's a segment of the audience where every time they hear about an older game getting patched, they're like, hey, that's cool, but where are my new games at? And this cross-generational support also extends, I think, to a sort of warped perception about the value of new games being made. An argument that I've seen happen over and over again right now with a lot of upcoming titles is that so many of them are planned as cross-generation releases and people are offended by that. There's this belief that because a game is being developed for next-gen systems and is having an old-gen version, that suddenly it is going to be, no matter what, ruined because it's being constrained by the limitations of the previous hardware. Which I think there is some degree of merit to that argument, but there's a lot of missing context and assumptions being made every time people make those arguments. How many of these games were in development for PS4 originally in mind anyways, and are benefiting from upgrades thanks to the PS5? And how many games are being designed with the PS5 specifically in mind, making full use of that system, and and just being sort of ported the best they can to last gen tech. And this is a thing that's been really for both systems. Xbox had that very heavy emphasis on smart delivery early on when they were talking about next gen hardware and emphasizing very heavily how really all of their first party titles were going to be made available across all the way from the original Xbox One up through the Xbox Series X. And PlayStation initially didn't really follow that narrative but ended up kind of backing out later to reveal, well, actually they are. There are some titles that are truly next-gen exclusive, like Ratchet and & Clank and the Demon's Souls remake, but numerous titles are getting releases on both platforms, including most recently, of course, Spider-Man Miles Morales, Sackboy Big Adventure, and upcoming titles like Kenna Bridge of Spirits and the sequel to Horizon Zero Dawn, Horizon Forbidden West. The cross-generation time period is always really weird because all the hype for next-gen obviously gets people excited and they want games to be pushing the limits of the system immediately and be the biggest and best thing possible, but that's not always gonna happen. First off, simply because the hardware is new and not everyone's going to have a perfect ability to develop on it right off the bat. And on top of that, a lot of developers don't really wanna do that yet. Obviously, not every single person out there buying games has a next-gen system right away, especially this time around with how difficult it's been thanks to all these scalping and bots that have been occurring buying out stock. And so it's not really in a lot of companies' interest to make games that are only appealing to that smaller demographic when plenty of people still own fully functional PS4s and Xbox Ones. The main takeaway I really want people to have here is that ultimately whether or not you feel like buying a system this early on, being an early adopter was worth it, is a subjective thing and comes down to your personal experience. But just from a slightly more objective standpoint, this has been really one of the better cross-generational times. People who are adopting systems right away, while not necessarily getting a whole bunch of brand new exclusive games right off the bat, aren't really getting them any slower than we did in past generations. And in fact, we're actually seeing more games get properly upgraded to take advantage of new hardware, which hasn't really been an emphasis before as far as console gaming goes. And for those of you that have yet to grab a new system, either because you are intentionally waiting or because trying to buy one just sucks right now, I just wanna give you that peace of mind of, honestly, yes, they are cool and I'm happy to have upgraded when I did, but 
it's not a be-all end-all situation. Enhanced performance is nice. A handful of new exclusives are great, but ultimately you're gonna be able to access much of the same library for the rest of this year, most likely. And it's not until we hit late 2021 and 2022, where you're gonna start seeing a lot more of those games that really start demanding, hey, maybe now's the time you really do need to grab one. Play games, have fun. That's why any of us really do this.